Cardiac catheterization is a common procedure done in hospitals, and clearly after people receive stents, many patients need to have anticoagulants. They need to have medications to help thin the blood. I'm Dr. Brian McDonough, and welcome to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. Today I have a very special guest from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Philip Empey. He's Assistant Professor of Pharmacy and Therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. And we're here to talk about something very exciting that he and his group are working on. Essentially, what they're doing is, after someone receives a stent to treat clogged arteries, they're being screened with a simple blood test to determine if they have a gene variant that makes them less likely to respond to blood-thinning medications. Dr. Empey, first of all, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. You know, we're talking about, to start off, a a very common procedure uh, performed all the time at hospitals, but I know as family docs, a lot of us have to deal with the period after that, when they are being anticoagulated, when they are on various medications, and we do get certain degrees of success. Tell me, first of all, what led you to be interested in this, and then a little bit how you are looking at the gene variants. Certainly. Well, many of us uh, know when we take care of patients that we don't always get the medication responses we expect. Uh, Many of our patients, and you know, certainly those taking medications for the first time, have the expectation that drugs simply work. Um, and, but if we look at sort of data across uh, the literature from many different companies, even from the FDA, we know that that really only happens on average in about 50% of patients. Um, for these particular medications uh, specifically, we know that about 10% of patients that go home on these antiplatelet medications in particular may have an, an adverse event later on, and particularly having an, a second event uh, or clotting off of the stent that they received in the hospital. And we think if we can select better medications up front, um, then we may be able to avoid or reduce some of those readmissions or secondary events. Now, you're talking about stents, obviously, and you're talking about trying to reduce those events, and it is a major issue. But you're, you're talking also um, in an article I read where you were saying that increasingly you're able to pinpoint gene variations and other factors that affect how patients metabolize drugs in general, and that, that we might be able to target drugs for the right person in the right situation, maybe avoid others for what they're doing. Tell me a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been increasing data supporting the use of pharmacogenomics, both in research and in clinical practice. So because we know so much about how medications work and particularly how they're metabolized in the body, it turns out that there's not that many different pathways that are involved. And if we can understand the variability in metabolism specifically, but also in drug targets, we may be able to understand which types of patients uh, may either have a greater or reduced effect of medication. So there's been a lot of information released from uh, groups like the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium that put out guidelines that uh, really help guide clinical practice. There's guidances out for pain medications, antidepressants, drugs like warfarin, as well as antiplatelet cyclopidogrel, and we're testing in this implementation. I'm with my guest, uh, Dr. Philip Empey. He's Assistant Professor of Pharmacy and Therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. Obviously, I've been out at Pittsburgh and have seen it's a major uh, hospital, major facility and educational center, med school. Um, Is this something you see at some point being done at small community hospitals around the country, or is this something which is more, uh, you know, to be at the scientific workbench? No, I, I do envision, I think most people do, I think, uh, think long-term that this is something we'll likely be offering uh, to patients uh, across the board. It just depends on when there's enough data amassed and when testing becomes available and inexpensive enough uh, for us to be able to offer in all settings. There are certainly primary care practices that are offering uh, testing through third-party type uh, small testing companies. There's even some community pharmacies that are offering elective testing as well. Uh, but it's certainly not commonplace. Um, I would sort of put it as uh, being tested or deployed clinically in a, in a relatively small number of academic settings, and then increasingly uh, more and more research is being added. Uh, we're one of a handful of groups across the country uh, that have turned on this type of testing, uh, specifically for clopidogrel uh, in the setting of cardiac catheterization. And you actually have developed an entire program. You call it Precise Rx, which is pharmacogenomics guided care to improve the safety and effectiveness of medications is an initiative. And, and you mentioned uh, that you have a multidisciplinary team. Um, who is involved in that team? What different specialties join? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it really has to be a team approach. We're, 
we've worked with physician groups and physician colleagues within the health system, um, both at the um, protocol level for, like, say, pharmacy and therapeutics committee, as well as cardiac intensivists, um, medical geneticists uh, within the lab themselves, even uh, payers, the health plan, uh, in terms of discussing how best to uh, cover these services. Also, the Institute of Personalized Medicine has a bunch of scientists uh, within the university that come together to try to determine how best to deploy precision medicine, as well as the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Uh, with pharmacy and you know all these groups, I think we can come together to address this big opportunity. You know, you mentioned a buzzword right now, which a lot of us are hearing in our own practices, and I'm sure we have a, you know, a nationwide audience and people outside the country, but the idea of personalized medicine. Since you're kind of at the forefront of it, clearly with a research project, but you have an institute and, and a group at your university in Pittsburgh which deal with it. Tell me a little bit about personalized medicine, um, where it has been, and where you see it impacting healthcare going down the road. Certainly. Now, I think a lot of people really uh, dislike that term. I mean, we obviously have been personalizing care for you know, centuries, um, but I think it really applies to using new technologies, um, such as um, genetic testing, along with existing good clinical diagnostic um, and you know, collecting clinical test results together uh, to really, rather than doing a one-size-fits-all approach to medicine, to really understand what's best for individual patients. You know, we do spend a lot of time developing protocols to make sure you know, individual patients get the best care possible, but we think we can do even better um, by tailoring care beyond simple uh, sort of one-size-fits-all protocols. When you look at deficiencies in medicine from your perspective, especially as a pharmacist, I think you have a unique perspective because you work with physicians in the hospital setting and, and without and also are involved with, with care through the medications. When you look at flaws or things we're doing wrong today um, that you'd like to change, what would you like to see changed? I think one of the biggest issues is actually, and really important for your listeners, is actually the transitions of care moving in and outside the hospital. Um, I mean, obviously, genetic information layers and other complexity on top of it, uh, but oftentimes understanding what medications are on, um, and we spend a great deal of time trying to figure that out, and it leads to, you know, issues surrounding both patients coming in and out of the hospital. Uh, beyond that, adherence is, is sort of an ongoing challenge, um, helping patients take their medications effectively. Um, is one of the sort of biggest issues we all struggle with. Um, we actually think that, you know, helping patients find the best medications up front may increase adherence. And, you know, we have a lot of initiatives here within University of Pittsburgh to try to help improve those transitions of care as well. You know, you, you are bringing up a big term, especially somebody you know, will we'll see patients in the hospital and bring them back to the office. But a lot of primary care doctors now might work either as hospitalists or in their office and might not do both if they're not in training programs or, or if they're in big cities. And that does, in, a, in effect, impact those transitions of care. You really got to communicate well if you're, you're handing off from one doctor to another. I think so. And it's particularly going to be important for sort of newer opportunities such as this. I mean, we've turned this on uh, from a clinical project perspective, um, you know, in, but in, in order to sort of get that out and get the information disseminated uh, beyond to the academic health centers, we really have to do a lot more to help educate providers at all levels and all disciplines of how to best use this information and work with the patient to get those great outcomes. I'm speaking with pharmacist Dr. Philip Empey, assistant professor of P&T at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, and talking about some issues in health care now. What are the medications that you see over and over again that we should be more aware of and more concerned about that we might not necessarily be uh, helping our patients with because we're not either following levels or, or giving them the proper doses? Where, where do you see problems uh, again and again? Well, I mean, I think overall, um, in, in general, we... Um, you know, need to be concerned about um, you know, things like antibiotics um, and chronic care medications where you don't, maybe you don't see the benefit of medications up front. It's really hard for patients to see that if they take their blood pressure medications or their glucose medications that it's having a direct immediate benefit. Um, so it's harder to convince them that it's uh, something that's important for their overall health. Um, I think, you know, with this particular protocol, you know, helping folks understand that if we know a little bit about uh, how medications are metabolized, and we know, for example, a patient may not be able to metabolize or activate uh, this medication appropriately, then it just may not be the best medication for them. And if they don't, you have to kind of, I guess, educate them, go over it with them. What about medications people stop taking? Are there certain ones 
you find that, that you have the problems with adherence more than others or, or characteristics of medications that cause people to be less likely to be adherent? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm less familiar with the overall literature in that area, but I think um, in, in general, higher cost items and are agents that have a little bit less monitorable um, immediate benefits are the ones that we, we struggle with most. I mean, uh, patients that have um, high uh, complexity typically have difficulty um, managing large dose medications, and those are the ones we target the most. If you look at sort of um, quality metrics or performance ratings, you know, the simple things, the you know, beta blockers, uh, falling MI or aspirin or, or some, some of the more simple ones are still somewhat challenging to help patients stay on because they just don't see the benefits uh, immediately in a short-term nature. One of the things that made me, um, when I saw your research and looked at the articles surrounding it, that m- jumped to my attention was, you know, you think you're well-informed in medicine and you know things, and I was like, wow, I didn't, can't believe it that, you know, about 30% of patients don't metabolize clopidogrel appropriately. I mean, that's a, 3 out of 10, that's a high number, and it's not something we really talk about a lot, you know, in medical circles, I know. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example. Um, you know, the cytochrome P450 2C19, which is the the gene test where we're using uh, for this one, pri- it's the primary uh, route of metabolism for clopidogrel. But in this case, uh, clopidogrel is a prodrug, so it needs to be activated in order for it to work. It's actually a secondary metabolite that provides its antiplatelet aggregation properties. So if you look across the frequencies of um, genetic variants that, re- that result in a poor uh, metabolizer phenotype, it is actually relatively high. If you look at the poor or reduced function together, these so-called intermediate metabolizers as a group, it does end up being about 30% of most, say, Caucasian populations uh, in the larger studies. So these are not things that are one in a million or one in a thousand even. These are things that are relatively common. And, and in just our first sort of two months, two, three months of this project, we've already encountered you know, many patients that um, come back with the test results suggest that clopidogrel is not the best medication for them. In those situations, we bring the clinical care team together uh, and think about changing to alternative therapies such as Prasagril or Ticagrelor. We only have a couple minutes left with Dr. Philip Empey. I wanted to ask you, what are the barriers uh, in your genetic work? What do you see as things that maybe are slowing progress? Because, I mean, from an outsider's view, boy, it looks like you're doing great and things are moving, but I'm sure there probably are barriers you have to deal with. Yeah, that's a great question. There are a lot of them. I, I mentioned education earlier. I think, you know, most practicing providers, myself included, didn't have a lot of genetics sort of in training when we went through to get our professional degree. So I think re-educating a workforce of how to use this data effectively is a, is a big one. Um, beyond that, sort of modifying our electronic health records to be able to store this information and create uh, protocols and alerts surrounding it that are, you know, easily used uh, and actionable is also sometimes a barrier. Uh, those systems are just not set up to store uh, lifelong uh, data with the same complexity as genetics. Uh, and then the final one is probably testing. I mean, I think there are more and more companies that are coming up available uh, to be able to use for testing. Um, but having ones that can produce a rapid enough turnaround time that we can use results uh, quickly is sometimes a challenge. You know, you mentioned EMRs and electronic records. Has it been helpful with med reconciliation? I mean, we talk about it a lot, med record discharge and the different products, whether it be you know, whether it's a Cerner product or whether it's Epic, they show how easy it is to do. do you, is that helping the process anymore? I think it is. Uh, on our end, we do have a system set up within both those health systems. Uh, we actually use both uh, Cerner and Epic here at UPMC. And, you know, I, I think having sort of a, a systematic process always helps things and using either pharmacists or nurses together, um, trying to work to identify the medications both coming in the hospital, while in the hospital, and then on discharge does certainly streamline the process, but looping the patient into that even more effectively and and thinking about better transitions even out to pharmacies, I think, are our next steps. You've been listening to Dr. Philip Empey. He's Assistant Professor of Pharmacy and Therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. Anything you wanted to leave our listeners with? Uh, I just, I think, my excitement for pharmacogenomics, and I think it provides a great opportunity for the future for teams to get together, for pharmacists and physicians and other providers to, to really think about Uh, new ways of using sort of this exciting new types of data to help patients get the best out of their medication. This is Dr. Brian McDonough. If you missed any of our conversation, please visit reachmd.com slash primary care today. You can download the podcast. You can learn more about the series. Thank you again for listening, and thank you, Dr. Empey. Thank you for having me.